Myth number one. Custer disobeyed his orders. The massacre at the Little Bighorn has often been blamed on George Armstrong Custer having disobeyed direct orders. But from first to last, the battle was plagued by muddled orders, beginning with those given by Custer's immediate superior, Brigadier General Alfred Terry. Terry's orders were very broad, allowing Custer a large measure of discretion, reading more like suggestions than direct orders. The Brigadier General commanding directs that as soon as your regiment can be made ready for the march, you will proceed up the Rosebud in pursuit of the Indians. It is of course impossible to give you any definite instructions in regard to this movement, and were it not impossible to do so, the department commander places too much confidence in your zeal, energy, and ability to wish to impose upon you precise orders which might hamper your action when nearly in contact with the enemy. He will, however, indicate to you his own views of what your action should be, and he desires that you should conform to them unless you shall see sufficient reason for departing from them. Custer did not disobey orders. He had full authority from his superiors to take whatever action he thought appropriate. Myth number two, the Indians set up an ambush for Custer. On June the 25th, 1876, an elated George Armstrong Custer announced to his eager men as they rode into sight of the village of their elusive Indian foes on the Little Bighorn River, we've caught them napping. But who was really caught napping? According to historians such as Edgar Stewart, the Indians were not at all surprised at the appearance of Custer's command. They had known for days the approximate location of the regiment. Flatiron, one of the Cheyenne chiefs, later went so far as to declare that plans for the entrapment of Custer and his men had been worked out at a council the night before the battle. Indian eyewitnesses in the village paint a different picture. Pretty white buffalo said that no one expected an attack. I have seen my people prepare for battle many times, she said, and this I know, that the Sioux that morning had no thought of fighting. Antelope woman, also known as Kate Bighead, was bathing in the river with many others and said, Everyone was having a good time, and no one was thinking about any battle. Rain in the face said the soldiers came without warning. It was a surprise, he acknowledged. The family of Sitting Bull, the man who supposedly masterminded the ambush by the Indians, was caught totally by surprise. Sitting Bull's young wife, Four Robes, was so frightened that she fled to the hills with one of her two infants. Realizing she had left one child behind, she raced back to the village to save it. This does not indicate that the family of the man who supposedly set a trap for Custer had any notion of an impending attack. Myth number three, Major Reno was a drunk and a coward. Well, not according to his fellow officers and the enlisted men who served under him. Civilian interpreter Frederick F. Gerard, whom Reno had once fired, offered mild criticism, saying he thought Reno could have held out in the timber longer. Captain Edward S. Godfrey also offered mild criticism before the Court of Inquiry, 
saying he was not particularly impressed with Reno's leadership and saw signs of nervous timidity. Captain Edward G. Mathy countered Godfrey, stating that Reno showed no sign of drunkenness and adding, I saw no action on his part to indicate want of courage or indicating cowardice. Of Reno's actions on the hilltop, Captain Thomas McDougall said he was perfectly cool and he was as brave as the many man there, in my opinion. Describing the battle of the second day when Reno walked the line with bullets flying, McDougall said Reno had plenty of nerve. The enlisted men's petition submitted up the chain of command lauded the actions of Major Reno and Captain Benteen and called for their immediate promotion. The accusation of Major Reno's drunkenness came from the testimony of civilian mule packers, B.F. Churchill and John Frett, who had personal grievances against Reno because he demanded to know why they were not on the battle line during the siege of Reno Hill. Lieutenant Wallace testified that he saw no evidence of insobriety and had never even heard the accusation until the court convened. Captain Benteen testified that Reno was entirely sober at the time. Ultimately, the court of inquiry did not find Major Reno remiss in his duties in any way, which did not save him from being found guilty by the pro-Custer press and partisans, leading to his descent into alcoholism and personal degradation. <laughs>